the Lagrange error bound. How accurately does our Taylor polynomial approximate the actual function value? If f of x is our series with infinitely many terms, it can be approximated by a finite polynomial. But exactly the series would equal the approximation polynomial plus some remainder. If I rearrange this to solve for r, I get our remainder function is equal to the absolute value of the polynomial approximation minus the actual sum. We use absolute value because we are concerned with the magnitude of this error, not with its sign. So our error is magnitude or absolute value of the polynomial approximation minus the actual sum of the series. This is helpful because even if you can't find the actual sum of the series, you can approximate a sum and find out how far off from the real sum your approximation is. If you use a Taylor polynomial of degree n centered about c to approximate the value of x, then the actual function falls within the error bound. We have a formula for that. It looks kind of messy, but I'm going to hopefully explain how to use it. This is very similar to the alternating series remainder formula. The only difference is that C is now replaced with Z, where Z is the X value between X and C inclusive, the N plus one derivative of F of Z, magnitude of that, a maximum. What is that talking about? Well, I'm gonna show you some scenarios for which we make sure we choose the Z that gives us a maximum. So here's the obvious. N is the degree of the Taylor polynomial, C is where you're centered at, and x is the value you're attempting to approximate. The complexity, z. What is that? z is a mystery number. We do have an interval for z, and we know that when we plug in z to the n plus first derivative of f of z, we need that to be the biggest y value possible. Scenario one, the n plus first derivative of f of x, that function, is decreasing on the interval c to x inclusive. For example, approximate sine of 0.1 using a fourth degree Maclaurin polynomial, find z for the Lagrange remainder. First of all, let's get the basics. n is for the degree of our polynomial, c we're centered at zero because it's a Maclaurin, and x, the value we're approximating, is 0.1. This means z must be on the interval zero to 0.1 inclusive. Sine x is an elementary series, so we can go off of our memory for that, or we can use the Taylor formula to create the polynomial. The polynomial will be of fourth degree, but remember the x to the four term has a zero coefficient, so it is not shown. Using this polynomial to approximate sine of 0.1, we're going to get 0 0.09983 repeating. So how do we choose z? In our Lagrange formula, we're looking for the n plus first derivative, and that n plus first derivative is the fifth derivative of sine x, which is cosine x. What does cosine x look like on the interval 0 to 0.1? The x that would give us a maximum possible y value would be our left end point, which is 0, our center. So when our function is decreasing, z should equal c. And in this case, because we have a Maclaurin polynomial, our center is 0, making z equal 0. Scenario 2, the n plus first derivative of the f of x function is increasing on the interval c to x inclusive. Example, approximate cosine of 1 using a second degree Maclaurin polynomial. Find z for the Lagrange remainder. Let's get the basics, n, c, and x. Our second degree polynomial centered at 0, and we're trying to approximate the value x equals 1. This makes z between 0 and 1 inclusive. We actually did an example of expanding cosine x in our Taylor video. If we're using the second degree Maclaurin polynomial, it's going to look like this. If we plug in one, then our approximation using the second degree Maclaurin polynomial is 0.5. So what z value would we choose to get a maximum y value in order to create the most accurate error bound? We're going to use the n plus first derivative, and that would be our third derivative, which is sine x. What does sine x look like on our interval zero to one? Sine x is an increasing function from zero to pi halves. Pi halves is about 1.7, so our maximum value is about here at x equals one. When the n plus first derivative is increasing, then z is equal to x. And in this case, z equals one, the right endpoint of the interval. In conclusion, we have three possible scenarios. Scenario one, is if your n plus first derivative is decreasing. If it's decreasing, then you're going to use z equals c, your center. 
For scenario two, if that indicated derivative function is increasing, then we're going to use z equals x, or the right endpoint of the interval. In your third scenario, what if your function is doing something like this, where your maximum is somewhere in between the endpoints? Fortunately, this scenario has never popped up on a past AP exam, so we won't need to go into detail on scenario three. Let's do some examples. For example one, we're going to estimate e squared using a Maclaurin polynomial of degree 10 for e to the x. Okay, so we have an approximation. To get a decimal approximation, I'm going to plug in this polynomial with two in for x into a calculator. Now, this seems very counterintuitive because if we have a calculator, why would we be using a Maclaurin polynomial to approximate? We would just plug it in, e squared, and get the answer. But the purpose of this lesson is showing you how the Lagrange remainder works, so just bear with me. After plugging in two for x in the polynomial, we get 7.389. For example two, we're going to use the Lagrange form of the remainder, also known as error, to estimate the accuracy of using this partial sum. Partial sum meaning the 10th degree polynomial we used in example one. Let's figure out what we know first. N, the degree of the polynomial, is 10. C, the center of our polynomial, is zero. X, the value we're attempting to approximate, is two. Remember that Z needs to be between the center and the value we're approximating. To choose our value of z, we need to find the f to the n plus first derivative. That would be the 11th derivative of x. Since our function is e to the x, it makes it a lot easier to find the 11th derivative because we know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Since e to the x is an increasing function, then we choose the right endpoint, which is x. So z would equal x, Therefore, in this case, z would equal two. Using the formula for the Lagrange remainder, we already figured out that f to the n plus one is f to the 11. z is two. Each of these numbers will always be the same. In this case, it's 11. The 11th derivative at 2 is e to the 2. Is it counterintuitive to have e squared in the error bound of how far off we are from approximating e squared? Yes, it's absolutely ridiculous. But we're choosing a simple example just so we can get the hang of how this works. But it's not going to be okay for us to leave e in our remainder. So we would need to replace a max value for what e squared could be. e is 2.7 something. 2.7 is close to 3. So 3 squared is 9. So that would be definitely an adequate alternative. And we don't need those absolute values anymore. We would write 9 times 2 to the 11 over 11 factorial. Another acceptable answer would be 8 times 2 to the 11. 8 is a little more precise, but I think 9 is a little more intuitive. Both of these answers would be acceptable on the AP test. If I plug in 9 times 2 to the 11 over 11 factorial into the calculator, I get this tiny decimal. That means our approximation in our polynomial, 7.389, is only off from the real value of e squared by 0 .0004617 and so on. That's a really, really good approximation. For example three, 
the fifth derivative of x is equal to 700 sine x. That's really nice. We don't have to derive anything. And if x equals 0.7 is in the convergence interval for the power series of f centered at x equals 0, find an upper limit for the error when the fourth degree Taylor polynomial is used to approximate f of 0.7. We do not need to write out a Taylor polynomial in order to find this approximation. But first, let's get our important values, n, c, and x. That means that z will need to be between 0 and 0.7. The fifth derivative is 700 sine x. On this interval, 0 to 0.7 sine x is increasing. The maximum y value on the interval, 0 to 0.7, is 0.7. So z will equal 0.7. Making our formula, A Lagrange error bound question will never be a calculator question, but I am going to put this into the calculator to get a decimal approximation just to get a better picture of what our error bound is. This is equal to 0.6315. But here's the thing. I'm guessing that I am approximating maybe cosine of 0.7 or sine of 0.7. So it would be very silly if sine of 0.7 were in the error bound. Now, I don't know what sine of 0.7 is, but I do know that sine of x is between negative 1 and 1. So the maximum value that sine of 0.7 could give me is 1. This means that sine of 0.7 could easily be simplified to be 1, since this needs to be the maximum possible value. We know that sine of 0.7 isn't 1, it's less than 1, but by putting 1 instead of sine of 0.7, we get an expression that's much easier to simplify, and that could be useful for future Lagrange remainder questions. Again, we're just using a calculator to get an estimate of what this looks like. This one is 0.9804, so definitely not as exact as this previous remainder, but would also be acceptable on the AP exam. Example 4. If the sixth derivative of f of x is a positive decreasing function, find the error bound when a fifth degree Taylor polynomial centered at x equals 4 is used to approximate f of 4.1. Assume the series converges for x equals 4.1. Let's get the essentials. I don't know what the function is, but I know it's positive and it's decreasing, so it's above the x-axis and it's decreasing. So from 4 to 4.1, our max value is going to occur at the left end point, or c. z equals c, which is 4. Our Lagrange remainder will be less than or equal to the absolute value, f to the n plus 1 derivative of z times x minus c to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Simplify. And without knowing what our actual function is, that is as close as we can get. We can take off the absolute value because we know the sixth derivative of f of x is positive. And there is our Lagrange error bound.